Thank you, Vito. This is what tradition is. It's about passing, passing the microphone on from one person to another. I just want to say thank you so much to Lawrence there uh, for the music. There he is. Um, any man who sings folk songs in a silk onesie in the 5-4 timing is incredible in my eyes. So can we have another cheer for Lawrence, please? Um, so this is the great challenge because I have 20 minutes to talk to you about uh, basically 40, 400,000 years worth of collected tradition that brings us to this place today of why we're we here and why is tradition so important and why is it absent or how does it now exist and the, the good news, bad news is like, I'm not going to answer that question um, but what I can do is, um, you know, through uh, setting up a personal reference explain for me why in a very sort of adverse way my purpose and drive is about creating community that uh, listens to each other as our lovely illustration uh, um, uh, tells us um, and ways that we can uh, honour that and foster that in our lives and where it is missing and what the impact of that that is missing. So I'm by untra I have no training whatsoever in anything but I'm a folk singer, um, I sing traditional songs, uh, that's how I make my living, I'm also a promoter of musical events. I've also come from a, a, a background of, uh, of nature, of nature, how should I say, nature work, nature teaching, nature worship. Um, and I was very lucky, I would just say a little bit about my background, that I grew up in an organisation um, that was a very left-wing sort of break off from the Scouts in, about 80 years ago, Forest School Camps. And this very progressive child education charity that I was very fortunate as an inner city London kid, where I was brought up just a mile or so up from here, um, was sent off to the countryside in an intentional community that uh, lived on the principles and, and uh, we fostered our ch ch children's experiences, me as a child, through this idea of, um, of, a, of a community that listened to itself, that gave a democratic responsibility to our children, allowed children the opportunity to explore the natural world and build relationships with this principle that if we look after each other, we in turn will be looked after ourselves. And learning through doing, teaching by being, that idea of how one uh, is, has to practice the, uh, the experiences because within a small community throughout the summers, uh, we were responsible for each other's well-being. And that for me fostered two great things, which was an absolute love of the natural world, which I then went into as a practitioner and a teacher of wilderness work bushcraft, all that sort of thing, but actually looking at particularly where communities have lived uh, in close proximity to nature and thus what happens today when we start to disconnect ourselves from the natural world and uh, I will talk more about that in a, in a moment, but also how music is such an important glue for society and for, and for building community and building relationships between one another. That old idea that the, uh, the family that sing together stay together, as it were. Um, and we, throughout our summers as children, all through my uh, growing years, uh, would spend our nights around the campfire singing song after song, repertoire about three, four hundred songs that we all just learned as kids and knew. Some of them old folk songs, some of them old English folk songs as we heard, Wild Mountain Time, or a lot of American folk songs, a lot of 60s radical pop songs, protest songs, that sort of thing. And this fostered in me this, this idea that actually those who sing together are ones who really uh, support each other and depend. There's something quite phenomenal. And in fact, uh, on an aside, I've just this morning got back from uh, the country of Georgia, um, just between Russia and Turkey and Armenia, uh, where I've been making a documentary with the BBC about their polyphonic singing tradition, which goes back over 4,000 years old, they can, they can tell. And the, the Georgian singing is what has kept a country that has been invaded from left, right and centre, from the, from the Soviets to the, in, through the, the, the Turkish armies. Throughout all those eras, their singing has walked what kept their independence and their culture so immensely strong. And it's really wonderful seeing an example. I was recording a lot of the, the families and the polyphonic singing communities there that have maintained uh, a tradition that has been uh, eaten away through uh, suppression. We are in a different situation with tradition in the UK. We are losing it at an, at an exponential level through the other most appalling force, which is neglect. Um, and uh, 
forgetting. And we are in an amazing place at the moment with our traditional repertoire of songs that go back. Um, well, it's time immemorial, we have no idea how old some of our oldest songs are. They are at least more than 2,000 years ago, some of our indigenous local songs. Um, and they have progressively disappeared at a rate fascinating if you draw a graph at the demise of folk singing and the number of folk songs that are actually being sung within an oral tradition, not by revival singers such as Lawrence and me who have picked it up from manuscripts originally but, or, or from other singers who've, uh, who've brought the tradition back to life. But those who've been passing the songs down from generation to generation within the family or community context, the rate of decline absolutely maps almost identically with the rate of biodiversity decline within this country and essentially we are, what we are seeing in the UK is happening around the world in terms of the disappearance of, uh, of uh, dialect and language and the absolute mass extinction of species. They are all uh, on this very steep downward slope that we've lost in this country, uh, we know the statistics of the natural world, we've lost something like 80% of our actual biomass of non-farmed agricultural species, and we are at a rate of something like 90% decline in some species. Other species such as the turtle dove and the nightingale and some of our iconic symbols of, of, of the British landscape and British songbirds, we're in a 98% decline, which means within 30 years we will lose many of our most uh, important species um, and, yes, and national emotional symbols, shall I say. Um, so we're in this fascinating time of immense loss, and with that goes a real disconnect from, from our heritage, uh, be that uh, our, the, if we think about the time that our grandparents were living in, be they from this country or another country, the amount of biodiversity that they would have experienced is so radically different to what we are experiencing now. So what does this mean though? Why, why, why should we care? Uh, and why do I care so much about it? And, uh, and, and, and in many ways, uh, is it such a bad thing if we lose our tradition? You know, we're here, we are a community. We are supported by each other, by our sponsors, by the, the, our hosts here. This is, we are gathering together, we are making connections. Um, and so I feel like, in many ways, our modern society is brilliant at fostering a lot of that, uh, that, uh, that, that glue, as I say, that, that integrity that keeps us together gathering. But it's a, what that continuity is and what is lost by our not listening to our own folk songs, for me, is a very important thing. Because uh, for me, I feel like there is a great wisdom in our elders. And one of my big drives uh, is to both do as much research to capture what is being lost at the moment, and I do that through travelling around this country, uh, Ireland and Scotland and England, uh, recording the songs of the Irish travellers, the Scottish travellers and the English gypsies who, as our kind of indigenous nomadic people um, and uh, community are very much chastised and looked down upon, are actually the last people to be carrying our indigenous songs in their family units and are still singing songs that nobody has heard, have never been recorded and when that last elder passes away, with them will go 10, 3, 5, 1,000 years, I don't know how long of music that has survived up until today. So we live in this extraordinary sort of precipice at the edge. Um, but also for me it's about how do we recontextualise, why is it being lost and how do we recontextualise this material? In for today's society um, and this is the big for me that as a, as a creative person I went to art school the best training in the whole world learned absolutely nothing and absolutely everything um, I'm sure there's some people who identify with that or how to make something out of nothing that's the greatest training and I think that entrepreneurialism is very contemporary but also we can learn a lot of that from our elders in many ways. This is not a new phenomenon, this sense of like resourcefulness and ingenuity. It happens in the natural world particularly, and as you know, in, uh, you know, in, in science and uh, bio, biomedicine and that sort of thing, we are looking at the way the natural world is connecting itself through, particularly through uh, fungal, mitochondrial, uh, not mitochondrial, uh, mycorrhizal connections within the forests, but we have this extraordinary uh, replication of community and communication in the natural world is so utterly sophisticated. There's so much that we can learn and we are losing it so fast that if we don't understand it before it's gone, we'll have lost 
essentially millions, billions of years of acquired knowledge and, uh, and cleverness. Um, so we're in this sort of dual race to try and understand and restore and essentially honour a lot of that acquired knowledge so that we can embed it within our way of life and so much of the way society and our contemporary lives are starting to exist and model themselves is actually very similar to some of those patterns in nature uh, as we become more and more of a kind of de democratic community in the choices we make and the way we connect with each other. I'm not an expert in that though, I'm just fascinated about where, where it happens and how it happens. So for me the thing that I, I'm working on is the, the preservation and conservation of this material. The preservation is about documentation, documenting it, making it accessible for us as creative people to hear those stories, hear those incredible life journeys of people who in this land, who are alive today, were born in tents on grass verges of roadsides and didn't have shoes until they were 25 and uh, lived this very itinerant and nomadic and ancient way of life and are disappearing as the modern world sort of expands. And also from, from there looking at how we, I can create spaces in our city, in our urban life to welcome in some of the, how shall I say it, the, uh, the methods, the celebrations of music and community that happened in the old world that actually can be very relevant today. And I do that through my organisation um, the Nest Collective, we put on concerts around the country. We, throughout May to September, um, do a series called the Campfire Club, where we have nine sites around the city, round campfires, no amplification, just wonderful musicians from all around the world of all different traditions, jazz, contemporary, classical, and folk music, um, playing music in a very ancient formation, which actually is immensely wonderful and intimate. And that sense of connectivity is so much about how uh, I'm trying to foster some of those opportunities to uh, welcome in the old into the new. Um, I also do it through things like my, the choir that I run, the fire choir, which is a, dem a protest choir, getting people to sing together, uh, getting people to uh, bring in uh, protest and protection into their way of life. You may have come across the Extinction Rebellion that's happening at the moment. A phenomenal movement to uh, acknowledge the fact that our uh, government is not uh, acknowledging the absolute climate crisis that we're about to reach. So we're bringing radical activism through music. So if you're interested in singing together and learning songs old and new about celebrating community and uh, speaking about social justice, uh, that's one of the, the hubs that I do. I also, for me, it's very important about using music as a way of brokering a broken relationship with the natural world. We are totally disconnected at our access to the, 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 the green spaces that this country is just clinging onto some very fine ecological site. I just want to ask, uh, hands up if in the last month any of you ha have been in the countryside outside of London, let's say, hands up. Good number of you, yeah, that's really lovely. And hands up here if there are people among us who would say that that is a really important, vital part of their, uh, I don't know, their, their practice about being in nature, being outside. Nice to see, yeah. Um, one of the things we have is uh, we've lost that Although Britain is the country with the highest membership rate for, uh, for nature organisations like the Wildlife Trust, National Trust, RS Rosside Protection of Birds, we have more members in this country than much of Europe put together. Yet we also have the absolutely worst policies for environmental protection. It's fascinating how we actually are the worst caretakers of our country, uh, yet we're, the, we're statistically the biggest lovers in Europe. Uh, and part of that is because we have uh, a very, very bad uh, um, system in which we can actually access nature and, uh, and how we are introduced to it and how we are shown the wonders of the natural world. For me, one of the most important things about, is about is music, how music can be such an introducer to the natural world. I run several projects throughout the, the summer, one of which is the Singing with Nightingales project, which sounds absolutely mad, but the Nightingale being our iconic symbol of love and poetry um, 
And I ask now, how many of you have actually ever heard a nightingale sing? One person. <laughs> exactly. It's a very rare bird. We have 5,000 left pairs left in the country right now, down from something like 250,000 about 40 years ago. Um, the finest singing creature in the whole world, one of the most exquisite songs, um, on a massive decline. They have the extraordinary capability that when they sing from April to end of May, the males are the only the singers, as all songbirds, it's only the males that sing, apart from the robin. Um, and the nightingales sing a particular song in the spring to court the females, and they sing it by night, in total silence of the night. And when they hear other music, they improvise and collaborate with. So when you go into a wood and you are there in a nightingale's habitat, and they are singing, and you sing or play an instrument, they sing back with you. It's one of the most extraordinary moments of communication and connection with nature. And I've started these concert series where we take 30 people a night, and now we're having a festival next year of, of, for 200 people to go into the forest, where we bring musicians from all different traditions, particularly musicians from Senegal, Cameroon, uh, Central African uh, Car and DRC Congo, where the nightingales live in the winter time, to come and collaborate with these birds, and we do these extraordinary collaborations that for many people is uh, one of the most profound ways of experiencing nature in its most magical moments in the spring, at night, under the stars and the moon. And it, it all comes down to the principle that if we don't know about uh, what there is out there that we are losing, how can we love it? If we don't love it, how can we look after it? And ultimately it is our responsibility to take care of uh, our natural world and our environment and our traditions, whatever they may be, whether they be folk traditions or whether they be traditions within our own families or from our own communities, um, that it's the kind of the case if you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And we have extraordinary treasure on our doorstep here in the UK. Um, and it would be a, a real tragedy and I think a, a, a real detriment to us as human beings to lose those qualities of both those worlds um, if we were to stop listening. So for me, it is all about creating new ways to pay attention. I think I should probably end there. That must be 20 minutes. And if it isn't, I'm open to a few questions. But Victoria, is that, is that my time up? Great. Brilliant. Some questions will now be shouted and I'll... Thank you very much for having me.